Professor Nell Irvin Painter examines white race theory, an 18th century notion created by Northern Europeans that considered Caucasians to be the ideal of beauty. Ms. Painter examines Americans' fears of immigrants, evidenced in the beliefs of Henry Ford to Theodore Roosevelt, and printed in news publications such as the Saturday Evening Post. Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, D.C. hosts the hour-long program. Thanks for joining us this evening, and um, we welcome Nell Everin Painter to Politics and Prose. The, the history of race and of the invention, contradiction, and manipulation of whiteness of the lighter-skinned people we call white today is the exploration of Professor Painter's new book. From the ancient Greeks to the early 20th century and what has led us to the 2010 census where we confront a given definition and categorization of race and identity, Professor Painter has written an entirely accessible, readable, myth-busting, and compelling history of race. She is a leading historian of the United States. She recently retired from teaching at Princeton University. She's prolific and award-winning scholar. Her recent books on history and race relations include Creating Black Americans and a second edition of Standing at Armageddon. And we are pleased to welcome her here this evening for <laughs> the history of white people. Uh, Professor Nell Urban Painter, welcome. Hello. You are a nice looking group. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Did I hear someone agree? <laughs> you all agree, yeah. What I'd like to do is uh, read to you for about 17 minutes or so from the first part of the book and then from the back of the book and then we'll talk, okay? I might have entitled this book Constructions of White Americans from Antiquity to the Present because it explores a concept that lies within a history of events. I've chosen this strategy because race is an idea, not a fact, and its questions demand answers from the conceptual rather than the factual realm. American history offers up a large bounty of commentary on what it means to be non-white, moving easily between alternations in the meaning of race as color, from colored to Negro to African American to black to African American, always associating the idea of blackness with slavery. But little attention has been paid to history's equally confused and flexible discourses on the white races and the old, old slave trade from Eastern Europe. I use white races in the plural because for most of the past centuries, when race really came down to matters of law, educated Americans firmly believed in the existence of more than one European race. It is possible and important to investigate the other side of history without trivializing the history we already know so well. Let me state categorically that while this is not a history in white versus black, I do not by any means underestimate or ignore the overwhelming importance of black race in America. I am familiar with the truly gigantic literature <clears throat> that explains the meaning, importance, an honest-to-God reality of the existence of race when it means black. In comparison with this preoccupation, statutory and biological definitions of white race remain notoriously vague, the leavings of what is not black. But this vagueness does not indicate lack of interest. Quite to the contrary, for another vast historical literature, much less known today, explains the meaning, importance, and honest-to-God reality of the existence of white races. It may seem odd to begin a book on Americans in antiquity, 
a period long before Europeans discovered the Western Hemisphere and thousands of years before the invention of the concept of race. But given the prevalence of the notion that race is permanent, many believe it possible to trace something recognizable as the white race back more than 2,000 years. In addition, not a few Westerners have attempted to racialize antiquity, making ancient history into white race history and classics into a lily white field, complete with pictures of blonde ancient Greeks. Transforming the ancients into Anglo-Saxon ancestors made classics unwelcoming to African-American classicists. The blonde ancient Greek narrative may no longer be taught in schools, but it lives on as a myth to be confronted in these pages. Before launching the trip back to ancient times, however, it may be useful to, to make a few remarks about the role of science or science of race. I resist the temptation to place the word science, even theories and assertions of the most spurious, pernicious, or ridiculous kind, in quotation marks for the task of deciding what is sound science and what is cultural fantasy would quickly become all-consuming. Better to note the qualifications of yesterday's scientists than to brand as mere science their thought that has not stood the test of time. I give scholars of repute in their day pride of place in my pages, no matter that some of their thinking has fallen by the wayside. Today we think of race as a matter of biology. But a second thought reminds us that the meanings of race quickly spill out of merely physical categories. Even in so circumscribed a place as one book, the meanings of white race reach into concepts of labor, gender, and class, and images of personal beauty that seldom appear in analyses of race. Work plays a central part in race talk because the people who do the work are likely to be figured as inherently deserving of the toil and poverty of laboring status. It is still assumed, wrongly, that slavery anywhere in the world must rest on a foundation of racial difference. Time and again, the better classes have concluded that those people deserve their lot. It must be something within them that puts them at the bottom. In modern times, we recognize this kind of reasoning as it relates to black race, but in other times, the same logic was applied to people who were white, especially when they were impoverished immigrants seeking work. Let me halt for a moment. Mike, where are you? I am going to need something to mop my brow because it is very hot here. <laughs> Thank you. Those at the very bottom were slaves. Slavery has helped construct concepts of white race in two contradictory ways. First, American tradition equates whiteness with freedom while consigning blackness to slavery. The history of unfree white people slumbers in popular forgetfulness, though white slavery, like black slavery, moved people around and mixed up human genes on a massive scale. The important demographic role of the various slave trades is all too often overlooked as a historical force. In the second place, the term Caucasian as a designation for white people originates in concepts of beauty related to the white slave trade from Eastern Europe. And whiteness remains embedded in visions of beauty found in art history and popular culture. Today, most Americans envision whiteness as racially indivisible, though ethnically divided. This is the scheme anthropologists laid out in the mid-20th century. By this reckoning, there were only three real races, Mongoloid, Negroid, and Caucasoid, but countless ethnicities. Today, however, biologists and geneticists, not to mention literary critics, no longer believe in the physical existence of races. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now you tell me if any of this remains on my forehead and those <laughs> little bits of white stuff that stick to you. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. 
Uh, where was I? They continue, uh, though they continue to, to recognize the continuing power of racism, the belief that races exist and that some are better than others. It took some two centuries to reach this conclusion after countless racial schemes had spun out countless different numbers of races, even of white races, and attempts at classification produced frustration. Although science today denies race any standing as objective truth, and the U.S. Census faces taxonomic meltdown, <laughs> we shall see, many Americans cling to race as the unschooled cling to superstition. So long as racial discrimination remains a fact of life and statistics can be arranged to support racial difference, the American belief in races will endure. But confronted with the actually existing American population, its distribution of wealth, power, and beauty, the notion of American whiteness will continue to evolve as it has since the creation of the American Republic. Now I think I'll read you the whole book. <laughs> Chapter one, <laughs> Greeks and Scythians. Were there white people in antiquity? Certainly some assume so, as though categories we use today could be read backwards over the millennia. People with light skin certainly existed well before our own times. But did anyone think they were white, or that their character related to their color? No, for neither the idea of race nor the idea of white people had been invented, and people's skin color did not carry useful meaning. What mattered was where they lived. Were their lands damp or dry? Were they virile or prone to impotence, hard or soft? Could they be seduced by the luxuries of civilized society, or were they warriors through and through? What were their habits of life? Rather than as white people, Northern Europeans were known by vague tribal names, Scythians and Celts, then Gauls and Germani. But if one asks, say, who are the Scythians? The question sets us off down a slippery slope, for over time, and especially in earliest times, any search for the ancestors of white Americans perforce leads back to non-literate peoples for whom no doc who left no documents describing themselves. Thus, we must shift through intellectual history, which Americans claim as Westerners, keeping in mind that long before science dictated the terms of human difference as race, long before racial scientists began to measure heads and concoct racial theory, ancient Greeks and Romans had their own means of describing the peoples of their world as they knew it more than two millennia ago. And inevitably, the earliest accounts of our story are told from on high by rulers dominant at a particular time for power affixes the markers of history. Furthermore, any attempt to trace biological ancestry quickly turns into legend, for human beings have multiplied so rapidly by a thousand or more times in some 200 years, and by more than 32,000 times in 300 years. Evolutionary biologists now reckon that the six to seven billion people now living share the same small number of ancestors living two or three uh, thousand years ago. These circumstances make nonsense of anybody's pretensions to find a pure racial ancestry. Nor are notions of Western cultural purity any less spurious. Without a doubt, the sophisticated Egyptian, Phoenician, Minoan, and Persian societies deeply influenced the classical culture of ancient Greece, which some still imagine as the West pure and unique source. That story is still to come, for the obsession with purity, racial and cultural, arose many centuries after the demise of the ancients. Now I'm going to read very fast. And here we are at chapter 28. The fourth enlargement of American whiteness. 
agitating and media dominating as America's civil rights and black power movements were, and those movements helped uh, gel the idea of one white race as opposed to several. Most of the country's white people might have doubted that the upheaval had much to do with them. They might have thought that they were individuals who had succeeded by themselves and that race had always meant black people who had not. In fact, by the 1960s, the whole races of Europe discourse had fallen completely out of fashion. And the races of Europe discourse is the part I read you really fast. Books such as William Z. Ripley's Races of Europe, published in 18, uh, 1899 and important for a quarter of a century. Books such as William Z. Ripley's Races of Europe, once a central reading on race, were now remaindered as useless. And if you were Jewish, calling Jews a race would send you straight into the anti-Semitic column. Reminders that Jews and Italians had been labeled as races a generation earlier might have prompted a retort that race was used more loosely in the past. This is true. But every use of race has always been loose, whether applied to black, white, yellow, brown, red, or other. No consensus has ever formed on the number of human races or even on the number of white races. Criteria constantly shift according to individual taste and political need. It was clear, however, that in the olden days, the 20th century, <laughs> in the olden days, Jim Crow had kept the colored races apart from whites and African Americans largely hidden behind segregation's veil. Shortly after the end of the Second World War, the end of legalized segregation began to propel black people into national visibility as never before. Concurrently, other changes were soon to deeply alter American sense of the very meaning of race. Little noticed at the time, the openness of the mid-1960s went beyond the black-white color line. The Immigration and Nationality or Heart Cellar Act of 1965 was specially crafted to counter earlier Nordic-minded immigration statutes, especially in terms of Asians. It also allowed for wider immigration from the Western Hemisphere and Africa. Therein lay the seeds of demographic revolution. New, new immigrants of the post-1965 era, overwhelmingly from outside Europe, were upending American racial conventions. Asians, greatly rising in number, were rapidly being judged to be smarter and eventually to be richer than native-born whites. Latinos formed 13% of the population by 2000, edging out African Americans as the most numerous minority. The U.S. Census, without peer in scoring the nation's racial makeup, had begun to notice Latin Americans in the 1940s by counting up heterogeneous peoples with Spanish surnames and hastily lumping them together as Hispanics. Though an impossibly crude measurement, it survived until 1977. By that point, the federal government needed more precise racial statistics to enforce civil rights legislation. To this end, the Office of Management and Budget issued Statistical Policy Directive Number 15. To this, uh, sorry, here was a change worth noting. In the racially charged decades of the early 20th century, governments at all levels had passed laws to separate Americans by race. Though Jim Crow segregation was supposed to be separate but equal, in practice, it worked to discriminate by excluding non-whites from public institutions, whether from libraries, schools, swimming pools, or the ballot box. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 began to change all that, so that by the late 20th century, the rationale for counting people by race had morphed into a means of keeping track of civil rights enforcement. 
Statistical Policy Directive Number 15 set the terms for racial and ethnic classification throughout American society by directing federal agencies, including the U.S. Census, to collect data according to four races, black, white, American Indian, Alaska Native, and Asian Pacific Islander. Hawaiian was added later as a concession to protests. And one ethnic category, Hispanic Latino, which is not racial. Elaboration was good for civil rights, but it opened the way to chaos. Under these guidelines, the Hispanic Latino classification portended enormous turmoil. Now that there was a non-Hispanic white category, did there not also exist Hispanic white people? Yes, no, and other. Faced with the given racial choices on the census of 2000, fully 42.2% of Latinos checked some other race rather than black or white, throwing nearly 6% of Americans into a kind of racial limbo. In addition, the U.S. Census of 2000 had to increase a deeper and more pers uh, personal recognition of multiracial identities. For the first time, respondents were allowed to describe themselves as belonging to one or more of 15 racial identities. As so often in the past, adding confusion, the list of races included nationalities. This expansion now allowed for 126 ethno-racial groups or for purists, 63 races. It did not take much an analytical ability to see that any notion of race lay so diluted as to lose much of its punch. And taxonomy was rapidly buckling much further under the weight of interracial sex. Nothing new here. Americans' disorderly sexual habits have always overflowed neat racial lines and driven race thinkers crazy. Asians and Native American Indians had the highest rates of interracial marriage, but others, including African Americans, now often married and had children f with people from outside their racial ethnic group. By 1990, American families were so heterogeneous that one-seventh of whites, one-third of blacks, four-fifths of Asians, and 19 twentieths of Native American Indians were closely related to someone of a different racial group. Now that was back in 1990. With some 12% of young people calling themselves multiracial, it is expected that by 2050, 10% of whites and blacks and more than 50% of Latinos, Asians, and Native American Indians will be married to someone outside their racial group. Though by 2050, the whole thing may have collapsed. With so many non-white and white Americans marrying willy-nilly, barriers between the progeny of European immigrants have largely disappeared. Among white people, three out of four marriages had already crossed ethnic boundaries by 1980. A generation later, few white Americans had four grandparents from the same country. William Z. Ripley had predicted uh, an out this outcome in 1908, fearing above all the inharmonious, that's his word, the inharmonious mixing of Italian men and Irish women. <laughs> but he now would have been forced to reconsider his prediction that such a racial mix would make Americans ugly. We have already seen the lowering of racial boundaries starting in the 1940s when ethnic began replacing race as applied to the descendants of European immigrants. The use of racial groups for white people has become a moribund category too, partly because white people are so mixed up. Finally, the perquisites of mere whiteness count for <coughs> less in the present situation, while the stigma of blackness, once just one drop suffice to curse the white-looking individual, also seems less mortal. 
Back in the 20th century, white people were assumed to be rich or at least middle class, as well as more beautiful, powerful, and smart. George Bush did away with that. <laughs> Sorry, that is not in the book. <laughs> Too late. Stop it back in. As citizens and scholars, they said what needed to be known and monopolized the study of other people with themselves hardly being marked or scrutinized in return. Think of Francis A. Walker and William Z. Ripley, for whom formal education, New England ancestry, and useful connections assured authority. Half a century later, the upheaval of the civil rights era turned the looking glass around, bringing white people under scrutiny. Think of Malcolm X and James Baldwin. Today, the attractive qualities that Saxons, Anglo-Saxons, Nordics, or whites were assumed to monopolize are also to be found elsewhere. After a string of non-white Mrs. America, Jennifer Lopez and Beyonce Knowles are celebrated as Hollywood beauties, Vijay Singh and Tiger Woods, <laughs> Uh, and the Williams sisters, Venus and Serena, dominate elite sports. Robert Johnson, the founder of BET, Bill Cosby and the financier Alphonse Fletcher Jr. have made millions. Oprah Winfrey is rich and famous. Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice have been secretaries of state and Alberto Gonzalez, attorney general. Even more to the point of uniting power and beauty, Barack Obama is president of the United States. First Lady Michelle Obama, whose skin color alone would have condemned her to ugliness in the 20th century, figures as an icon of beauty and intelligence on the global stage. None of these individuals is white, but being white these days is not what it used to be. <laughs> Thus, it is sensible to conclude that the American is undergoing a fourth great enlargement. Although race may seem overweening, without legal recognition, it is less important than in the past. The dark of skin, who also happen to be rich, say people from South Asia or, uh, or African American or have a Hispanic background, and the light of skin from anywhere who are beautiful, are now well on the way to inclusion. Is this the end of race in America? Is this the end of race in America? No. Oh, I think we need I think we need democracy here. Okay, let's take a vote. If you think yes, put your hand up. Two? <laughs> Three. Three. If you think no, put your hand up. The no's have it. <laughs> a recount, yes, okay. Okay, now let's, let's not discuss it. We've, we've had our vote, <laughs> and we'll sign it tomorrow. <laughs> is this the end of race in America? We know it is not. At the turn of the 21st century, it was starting to look that way. Back in 2000, remember that? Back in the 90s? In 1997, the American Association of Physical Anthropologists urged the American government to phase out the use of race as a data category and to substitute ethnic categories instead. Geneticists studying DNA, the constituent material of genes that issues instructions to our bodies in response to our surroundings, were also concluding that race as a biological category made no sense. The habit of relating human heredity to the environment may be traced back to antiquity, but early 19th century racial thinkers turned the notion around, deeming race a permanent marker for innate superiority or inferiority. Not until the 1850s did the influence of environment on heredity get rescued with Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. Darwin described a world much older than the biblical 5,000 years reasoning that heredity was not fixed, that generation after generation, living things change in response to their surroundings. Our 
arguments over race in the human genome have subsided of late, leading, leaving us with some intriguing data about personal appearance. Prevailing racial schemes now rest once again on concepts of skin color, hence black and white people. But widely recognized is the fact that not only are black people actually various shades of brown and yellow, but so too are white people, merely somewhat lighter and often with a lot more pink, or if they've been in the sun, a lot more red. <laughs> Hence the red scare. As Blumenbach realized in the late 18th century, one group's skin color shades gradually into another's. There are no clearly demarcated lines. Some people who identify as black may have lighter skin than others who identify as white. Siblings with the same mother and father can display a range of skin colors. Race may be all about pigment, but what makes people's skin light or dark? Skin color is a byproduct of two kinds of melanin, red to yellow pheomelanin and dark brown to black eumelanin in reaction to sunlight. And several genes interact to make people light or dark, reddish, brownish, or yellowish. Ancient scholars were wiser than they knew when they related skin color to climate. Today's biologists concur. Sunny climates do make people dark-skinned, and dark, cold climates make people light-skinned. How much of which sort of melanin people have in their skin, and to what degree it is expressed, depends entirely over time on exposure to the sun's ultraviolet or UV radiation. Melanin both protects against excessive ultraviolet radiation and allows sufficient UV radiation to enter the body. Too much UV radiation causes skin cancer and lead to death, but UV radiation is crucial for developing fetuses and strong bones. So where are we now? Mapping the human genome elicited initial proclamations of human kindredness across the globe. Then race talk inscribed racial differences on our genes. That talk has not disappeared. But ideally, we would realize that human beings' short history relates us all to one another. To speak in racial terms, incessant human migration has made us all multiracial. Does this mean the human genome or civil rights or desegregation have ended the tyranny of race in America? Almost certainly not. The fundamental black-white binary endures, even though the category of whiteness, or we might say more precisely, a category of non-blackness, effectively expands. As before, the black poor remain outside the concept of the American as an alien race of degenerate families. And I should explain that I have a discussion of the concept of alien races, which was applied to immigrants and their children from Eastern and Southern Europe. And degenerate families were the poor white families slated for involuntary um, uh, sterilization. A multicultural middle class may diversify the suburbs and college campuses, but the face of poor, segregated inner cities remains black. For some time now, many observers have held that money and interracial sex would solve the race problem, and indeed, in some cases, they have. Nonetheless, poverty in a dark skin endures as the opposite of whiteness, driven by an age-old social yearning to characterize the poor as permanently other and inherently inferior. Thank you. You can stay here, and then and we, we have about 20 minutes for questions. Again, if you could just get to the microphone. In the okay. Aisle. There's, yeah. yeah. There's one here. Okay. May the race go to the swiftest. <laughs> Here we have a race. Yes, sir. How's it going, Professor? I have sort of a polemical question. Oh, no, no, no. Please. Please. <laughs> Please just ask a question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm trying to gather the intended goal or purpose of your book, like what you would like 
to happen if all so-called white people read and agreed with your premise. Because when I read works like the Encyclopedia of Western Colonialism, mm -hmm. it talks about, and I quote, the colonial powers of the West claim possession to nearly all of America and Australia, 99% of Polynesia, 90% of Africa, and nearly 50% of Asia. Or when you read the book we even have here in the store, Who Owns the World? That one talks about the largest landowner in the world presently is Queen Elizabeth, who just happens to be white. <laughs> yeah. Both of these books still state that people who classify themselves as, as white still own land that wasn't originally theirs, still own or control resources that weren't originally theirs. So with your book, are they just to apologize? and give the land and resources back to the rightful owners because now they understand they were tricked into whiteness? Or is this work more of just a play on semantics, but the overall world power dynamics will not change? So what, Are those again, the what's only the, choices? Yes. <laughs> what's the intended goal? Well, no, what's the intended goal or hopeful goal of your book? I don't think I can win here. <laughs> If those are the only choices, uh, I'm going to have to check the other box. Um, my book is the work of a historian, not someone uh, who's making policy. Not a what? Uh, not an advocate. Well, I don't know. That's, that's a hard one, too. Uh, but let me just say that my goal was not to change the world. So what I would like people to know from reading my book is that Whiteness is a concept. It is not something biological and permanent and inherent, intrinsic, and that it has the ideas about it have changed over time. That whiteness has a history. That's what I wanted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to know if, in your research, um, that you found any evidence that um, this uh, crossing of the racial barriers that we're experiencing is leading to um, better families, that if the people have... Oh, another hard question. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, if people have more choice, that they can choose better, perhaps, leaving out Tiger Woods for, yeah. you know, well, <laughs> just, he's just one person. but. You know, uh, I was wondering if, if, you know, having more leeway to mm -hmm. choose is producing um, better parents and, you know, better families as a result. Well, um, that's another hard question, uh, maybe even another trick question. No tricks. No tricks. Uh, okay, and once again, I'm going to appeal to this intelligent, beautiful audience. We're going to take another vote. Uh, I think you all heard the question as to whether or not more choices produce better families, right? Is that a fair paraphrase of your question? Yes. Everybody understand? Okay. No. Does more choice, you can, you can reach out and marry or have sex with more different kinds of people these days, right? Does that make it better? No, wait, wait, wait. I didn't ask you for an essay. <laughs> I just want yes or no. So yes is more choice makes it better. No is more choice doesn't necessarily make it better. You ready? No. <laughs> this is still yes or no. Yes, more choice makes better families. Okay. No, it doesn't necessarily. Uh, well, this time it's closer. This time, I think the no's still have it. And I'll bet they're going to say, as I heard other people say, it makes it different. Makes it different? It makes it different. Okay. My name is Tommy Boyd, and my question's not difficult. <laughs> okay. Simple. That's the hardest guy. <laughs> <laughs> this week we we're filling out the census yes. forms and so uh, looking on that um, it seems to me that uh, the groups are identified generally by geographic location except for one which implies that there's only one skin color that's really important and that's white. So 
why isn't there um, an effort to not use that at least on the census? You can be black. You can be black, African American, Negro. You, you know, you have a lot of choices in that line, but it does include black. Yeah, but then the other one that um, I think confuses um, the use of Caucasian, which. I don't know if people with Let's variety. See, I don't think Caucasian is in the census now. Is well, it? no, no, it's but not in now. society in general, yeah. using that. Definitely. How Definitely. many people with those various shades of a light were from the Caucasus Mountains ever? Zero. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was easy. Okay. There's the easy answer, and the other part I cannot answer, but I can say that every ten years, census categories adjust to take account of what the federal gov government thinks it needs to count up. So in the middle of, it started off in 1790, and there's a picture in my book uh, of the first census categories, and there, there was only one race uh, listed, which was white, uh, and it was, I think, in five different permutations. And then there were <coughs> unfree people, um, who at that point were of various races. Um, and then in the middle of the 19th century, the census added mulatto, I think only for one census. <laughs> and then, bless you. Uh, and then in the uh, early 20th century, for white people, they broke white people down into native born and foreign born. And you had to say where your parents, you know, maybe even your grandparents were born. So it's changed over time. And if you make a movement, maybe you can get, you know, pink. Uh, gray, brownish, you know, you could get some more, yeah, variety. <laughs> okay. Um, a quick statement and then a quick co question. A really quick statement. Really quick, really yeah. quick, which is just, um, I had the great good fortune of a long friendship with Winthrop Jordan. Oh, yes. And all through your talk, I thought how excited he would have been to hear this talk. So, just to say that. Okay, as, thank uh, you. As a historian to historian. Indeed. My question is, um, you know, I ticked my census form last week mm -hmm. and uh, wrote across it, come on guys, you know race is a social construct. Uh -huh. But then I ticked white because I know they've got to count these things and they're trying to figure this out. <laughs> yeah. So my question is, how did you tick yours and why? Well, mine's pretty straightforward. I ticked uh, black. Um, my husband ticked white um, be because as far as we know, he is. Um, and, but something interesting has been happening. You know, my book came out on the 15th of this month, and since then I've been talking to people. And I hear sort of permutations of this question uh, over and over again, and sometimes people are upset. Um, but I only hear that from people who are upset over the white box, because they know that's the one that the census or somebody wants, the black helicopters or something. Uh, wants them to check, and they're they're not comfortable with it. And I think, I guess, what's happening is that in the 21st century, um, white people are more and more becoming uh, aware of themselves as having race in addition to just being individuals, and now seeing how awkward a fit uh, a category meant to. Uh, include millions and millions and millions of people really can be. So uh, we are facing a kind of white dilemma, I think, that's going to be really interesting. Yes. Hello, and thank you so much for coming. And I say, here, here to this book. You know, we had, was it last year when they had the television show twice, Black in America. And I was like, Will they ever ask the, you know, make up the same white in America? Why can't we kind of, you know, pick that apart, get to understand yeah. that? And if they do, I hope that you're one that they consult. Um, my next uh, question was, um, would you agree, or maybe not the question, would you agree, but I, I felt as I watched turmoil kind of take place in this country over the past year, it almost looked like an addict. Like, you know, racism was almost like an addiction. Hmm. The need for this country to hold on to that, to that separation is like an, an addict needing to hold on to something. Hmm. And then, the, and then the, the denial of this, this addiction and the destruction that it does on themselves. How do, you, how do you feel about that? I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's a really interesting uh, and insightful way of talking about it. Um, 
anthropologists have spoken of um, people addicted to race as people who believe in witchcraft, in, in that you can never disprove it. If you point to somebody, you know, you disprove their analysis of something that's based on race, then they have a way of getting around it and holding on to their belief. But I think this has been going on f for longer than just the last year. Um, and I picked it up. My last book, um, Creating Black Americans, has a chapter on uh, rap music and hip hop culture, you know, which is 35 years old now. Uh, speaking of things that have history. And uh, a good bit of the anxiety that comes out there is trying to get black people back in the box. This is what black people are. And a lot of black comedy is based on that. This is what black people are. This is what black people do. And it, it's, a, it's a kind of fabricated, unitary image. Uh, which I think is the kind of, uh, showing the kind of anxiety that you picked up in the culture at large. So um, post-segregation, I think Americans generally are trying to figure out who we are according to our, th our traditional bases. And the new bases are so much more about class because we are living in a country with the most profound inequalities of income and wealth, I think just about in our history, uh, certainly in our post-slavery history. In the slavery South, the disparities were infinite. But uh, since that time, you know, we've, we've really reached uh, very few people who are very rich and uh, a l increasing numbers of people who uh, are, are increasingly back black and brown who are just scraping by. Yes. We're, we're going to take the last, whoever's in line here, last four or five. That's, yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. Oh, thank you so much for coming. And um, my question, I guess, just to give context, I grew up in D.C. and went to very multiracial public schools and then went away to a college that was very progressive and much whiter. Um, and there seemed to be almost a preoccupation among the student body about I guess the concept of white privilege hmm. and trying to be sensitive about white privilege mm -hmm. but almost to the point where it would come f full circle and we were taught you know as part of our sensitivity training um, when we were teaching inner city schools that science came from white men and you know I, and that that doesn't that was like one student trying to trying to work through that and trying to mm -hmm. train the students but it, this kind of preoccupation and self-consciousness about whiteness I found really interesting because I wasn't used to it. Um, and I guess I'm wondering what, what historically, what was the, is the appeal and the attraction of this category that, that kind of has no actual categorical basis? It well, it has a teeny weeny basis. And I assume that's your question, right? Or what what yeah. the appeal is, yeah. yeah. Oh, what the appeal is, yeah. The appeal is that um, your people, whoever they are, assuming that you Let's d just, just make you William Z. Ripley for the moment. Um, you uh, well-educated um, New Englander, uh, wealthy background, um, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, uh, MIT, and so forth, um, have a, a way of explaining why you are beautiful and nice, and they are ugly and poor. Sorts out the world. Thank you. Uh, hi, I I heard you mentioning the uh, fact that was a white slavery back in in Europe a uh, long time ago. Not just a long time ago. Slavery exists in our world. And uh, uh, this white slavery, um, the the words slave and slave, they're yes. surprisingly similar. They're not surprisingly similar. They are related. Um, and uh, I mean, there were sharp differences between different groups uh, of people in Europe. Um, but now, you go you go to the census form and you see just one box for white. Uh, well, it depends. People. Every country does it differently, and in France, they do not collect by race, but are thinking about it. I'm, I'm talking about America right now. Uh -huh, oh, in the sorry. census box, you have one yes, box. Yes, uh, yes. Whereas, uh, uh, if you go back in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, 
people coming through Alice Islands, they would say, oh, Europe is vomiting, and uh, you have all these uh, undesirable, mm -hmm. unruly mm -hmm. folks mm -hmm. coming. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, given that now you see just one box for white, maybe in 100 years uh, we're not going to see a box at all for race in the census form. What do you think? I, th I think that's very possible because people are just so mixed up. And uh, we're having our little mini revolt about, about uh, checking the white box, certainly. So, and then uh, the largest immigrant group now is Latinos, and they're supposedly more Latinos than African Americans. Um, and Latinos can be of any race. Um, there are also large numbers of African descended immigrants who don't necessarily associate themselves with. African Americans, uh, Native African Americans, <laughs> whom they see as lazy and inferior. Um, so the whole thing is getting mixed up. Um, something like only 46 percent of uh, current immigrants, I think this is like 2008, uh, identify themselves as white, whereas something like 70 to 80 percent, 78 to or 76 to 80 percent of Native born Americans identify themselves as white. So white is getting to be less popular. We'll see. Thank you. Thank you. Take the last, last three questions here. Okay, a couple of things. You began by talking about Greeks. Yes. They were slave owners. Romans were slave owners. Generally, they're slaves Not or all conquered of them. people. Not all of them, just the tippy top. <laughs> no, no, no. They, they had slaves, whoever yes. they conquered, yes. they made them to slaves. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Now we come to this country. And you had capitalism at work in terms of southern plantations needing labor yeah. to sell cotton yeah. to England. Yeah. So they um, bought I'm, I'm going to correct you here a little bit because the whole plantation system started with sugar. Sure. That's a big difference, okay. and uh, it started before capitalism really got going. Well, look, it was so, call it commerce. Um, you can call it commerce, which okay. is different. But they brought blacks over to be bought and sold. To work also, a lot of white people to work in these places. The majority were black. Finally, yes. And it was a big trade. It was a circular mm -hmm. trade. Mm -hmm. A it triangular went, trade. Yeah. yeah. The, the ships came from the north. What is your question, Went to sir? Africa, what is them. your question, they sir? Brought rum. My question is, if you look at the basis of race worldwide and set aside the American experiment. Set aside the American experiment. Set aside the American experiment, <laughs> yeah. which was created by a peculiar need of commerce, it is not endemic. I can't go with you on your if. Because uh, the the question is, what is the question? <laughs> I disagree with you. What the question is the question? Is, when you deal in race, yeah, you have to look at where it proliferates and the reasons why. And in every part of the world, it's different. So you can't just generalize by using the American experience. I certainly can. I'm talking about the United States. Well, I'm not. Okay, sir. You got to look elsewhere. Okay, we'll leave that book to you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hi. Monique Mitchell, and it is very interesting that this gentleman uh, more or less um, mentioned what I wanted to say. Uh, but, however, I'm going to start with uh, the history of white people. Uh, I was expecting a more universal type of situation. And I do realize with here uh, the people and you as the author that we are back to the same subject, black and white in the United States. It just happened that I do come from another country and you mentioned France. A uh, few, actually uh, six or seven months ago, I was asked, what's your race? because I was filling a question by phone from the Washington hospital. And the man was the questionnaire, and he said, Caucasian, of course. And I said, yes, Caucasian. And I said, no, 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 black. And he said, black? 
And I said, yes, because I'm a descendant of Lucy, most likely, so I am black. Uh, Not anyway, most likely, definitely. Yes. So what I want to say to yeah. you is yes. that please give us a book next time which give us an aperçu of the universal black and white world. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, mais tant pis. <laughs> Plus euh, de livres sur ce sujet. Le prochain livre, c'est sur le sujet de la beauté humaine. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, just another angle. Um, I used to live in the UK, and if you want to discuss how um, categorization really gets taken to the extreme, and for a certain number of people, and that is people of color, so. Um, if you're black, you have a self, you have basically a whole laundry list. Are you black African? Are you black Caribbean? Are you black mixed? If you're black mixed, who are you mixed with? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's black other, which I fed in because I was an American, uh, yeah. black American living there. But when you look at the, uh, the English white, it's basically just one, one category. And the question is, when, what will it take and when would it become desirable for, for white people to actually describe themselves to the same degree that other races, quote, races are asked to describe themselves? Or is there a fear that there will be a loss of power? Because one statement I heard, and I'd like to hear your comment on, is that there were not any white people until they came to America, and that's when all the Italians, English, <laughs> uh, et cetera, et cetera, united. And is there a a fear as a loss of power if um uh, okay i, I yeah, understand that sure. i think yeah uh i think the fear of loss of power is already underfoot uh or in the air or whatever uh without tampering any further with the categories i think categories tend to lag behind um uh, the powerful the pow power arrangements so for instance uh as asians become richer they will also become more beautiful um, and as we get all mixed up, the taxonomy will have to somehow catch up to us. Um, one thing that American historians have found very frustrating over the years is that we c have a lot of trouble um, cat classifying people according to wealth and income, which I think would be a much more useful way of dealing with the inequities of the society. Thank you very much. <laughs> Nell Irvin Painter is an American history professor emerita at Princeton University and the former head of the university's African American Studies program. For more information, visit nellpainter.com. All this month, see the winners of C-SPAN's Student Cam Video